Hi, my name is Walker Red, and I'm a GI Fellow at the University of North Carolina. I want to thank the GIE editorial team for the chance to discuss our article titled Association Between Time from Esophageal Food Impaction to Endoscopy and Adverse Events. I also want to thank my co-authors for their work on this project that we performed here at UNC, especially the senior author, Dr. Evan Dellen, and other faculty members at the UNC Center for Esophageal Diseases and Sw Swallowing. I'll first explain why we wanted to perform this study. Our research group wanted to conduct this study because we often focus on studying eosinophilic esophagitis, or EOE. And of course, patients with EOE are at risk for esophageal food impactions. Although food impaction is a relatively common reason for GI consult and upper endoscopy, few studies have focused specifically on food impaction. Much of the evidence that guides our management of food impaction is actually based on studies that were performed in patients that differ from what we commonly see here in practice which is usually patients coming in after having swallowed soft foods like chicken or as is often the case here in North Carolina, pork barbecue. Specifically, there is little evidence assessing whether longer time from food impaction event to endoscopy increases the risk of adverse events. In fact, the most current guidelines on the management of food impaction cite studies that included large proportions of patients who had swallowed fish bones or non-food foreign objects like button batteries or coins. A few of these older studies did find that a longer time from, from impaction of those foreign objects or fish bones to upper endoscopy increased the likelihood of an adverse event like an esophageal perforation occurring. Based on these data, guidelines recommend endoscopy to remove any foreign body impaction be performed emergently or at least urgently. Furthermore, there's this idea among clinicians in sort of anxiety about the fact that an impacted food bolus may cause pressure injury to the esophageal mucosa, eventually leading to ischemia, necrosis, and even a perforation at the site of the food bolus impaction. For these reasons, it, is, it has been our practice at UNC to come in and perform urgent endoscopy whenever a patient presents with a food impaction, even if it's in the middle of the night. However, some patients present long after experiencing their food impaction, and at least anecdotally, we did not think that these patients seem to have adverse events more frequently than patients who presented sooner. Even if there is some superficial injury that's noted on the esophageal mucosa where the food was impacted, these changes usually did not seem but so clinically significant, and it seemed unlikely that a difference of a few hours overnight would allow for that injury to cause a more serious adverse event, like a perforation. We are interested to see that the study Krill et al. published in GIE a few years ago showed that there was no difference in outcomes when comparing patients with soft food impactions who underwent endoscopy before or after 12 hours of having symptom onset. Furthermore, there may be trade-offs in how urgently endoscopy is performed. An urgent endoscopy is no longer performed for certain other conditions that used to warrant urgent endoscopy, such as upper GI bleeding. There is evidence showing that anesthesia-related adverse events are more likely to occur with emergent endoscopy compared to routine endoscopy, and depending on where the endoscopy is being performed after hours, there may be particular centers where there are logistical challenges to things like making sure the esophageal biopsies that are taken are appropriately submitted to the pathologist. Therefore, we decided to perform a retrospective cohort study of all of the patients who presented to UNC with an endoscopically confirmed food impaction over a seven-year period of time to determine whether there was any association between time from food impaction event and adverse events. We thought that this was a clinically relevant question to answer, especially given the likely variation in practice patterns in terms of how urgently patients undergo endoscopy for food impaction at different centers. In this study, we classified adverse events as either esophageal, which included mucosal tear, bleeding, or perforation, and extraesophageal, which included aspiration, respiratory compromise, hypotension, and arrhythmia. We further classified esophageal perforation or extraesophageal adverse events requiring ICU management as serious adverse events. We then compared patient characteristics as well as event and procedural details between those who did and did not have adverse events. We also performed multivariate analysis with logistic regression to assess whether there was any association between time to endoscopy and adverse events. There are a few specific ways our study differed from other similar studies. Although we included patients who had swallowed actual foreign, excuse me, 
Although we excluded patients who had swallowed actual foreign bodies like batteries, we did not exclude patients who had swallowed food that may have contained bone. And in fact, seven of the patients had a bone visualized within the impacted food bolus during the upper endoscopy. While we wanted to report details about endoscopic findings in the paper, we decided to primarily focus on adverse events that are more clinically significant, such as esophageal perforation or aspiration events requiring a higher level of care, because considering local endoscopic findings like some local ulceration to be adverse events may actually overestimate the risk associated with food impaction. Given the potential that patients with EOE are at higher risk of adverse events, we also pre-specified those patients as a subgroup to evaluate separately, a priority. Lastly, in addition to assessing time from event to EGD as a categorical var variable, we assessed this time as a continuous variable in order to add, provide more information about whether there was any relationship between time and adverse events. We do believe that our study adds to existing knowledge. No matter how we analyzed our data, we found there was no association between time and adverse events. And importantly, we also found this to be true for patients with EOE. We also found that only two serious events occurred and that the one case of esophageal perforation was actually related to injury from an overtube device rather than the food bolus itself. As may have been expected, patients who are older and had higher ASA scores were more likely to experience adverse events. But as been shown in prior studies, there were few clinical predictors of exactly which patients would experience those events. Of note, we also identified gaps in the care of these patients that have been reported in other studies. Specifically, we found that esophageal biopsies remained underperform at the time of impaction and that patients are often lost to follow up after food impaction. Overall, our study adds to the growing body of literature showing that slightly longer time to endoscopy, slightly longer time to endoscopy is unlikely to increase the risk of adverse events. In terms of what comes next, there are a few important considerations and aspects of food impaction that would benefit from further research. Our largest concern about delaying endoscopy for even a relatively short period of time overnight has to do with the patient's experience because having an ongoing food bolus impaction can be very distressing. Therefore, it would be helpful to conduct a study to better understand the patient perspective. Of course, a multicenter perspective study comparing any differences in outcomes by timing of endoscopy would be beneficial to better understand whether there's any relationship between time and outcomes. Lastly, quality improvement efforts are warranted to improve the frequency with which esophageal biopsies are taken. To summarize our conclusions, we found that serious events are unlikely to occur at the time of esophageal food impaction, and that longer time to endoscopy is unlikely to increase the risk of an adverse event. Therefore, in the absence of clear clinical concern for aspiration or active patient decompensation, the decision of whether to perform EGD overnight or waiting until the morning should be balanced with the risk associated with more urgent endoscopy, other logistical considerations, and the patient's distress. Thanks so much for taking the time to learn more about our study.